So what I'll do now is I'll just do this introduction and then uh, and then we'll get stuck in if that's okay. Okay, yeah. Right, you're going to be flattered now, so uh, prepare, yeah? Prepare yourself. Oh dear, well, go on then. <laughs> okay. I love it, really. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Northern Art Podcast with me, Hank Cosgrove. I hope you've enjoyed the previous episodes. I received various messages about the last one with Mike Knowles, including one from the Royal Cambrian Academy, of which Mike is a member. They were delighted to hear Mike and listen to his views and stories, and they've now promoted the episode on their own social media and website too. I think I'm finding that I'm really enjoying the stories that are emerging when I'm recording these podcasts, and so with that in mind, I think I've got another very special guest lined up for you today. My guest was born in Sheffield in 1940. She was a graphic designer and an art teacher before moving to Cockermouth in Cumbria in 1986 and bought a large Georgian house. She converted the house into a gallery which opened in 1987 and over the next 25 years established it as one of the most loved and friendly galleries in the north of England. During that time she mounted some outstanding exhibitions, including ones by leading 20th century artists. We'll talk about one or two of those today. These include L.S. Lowry, Sheila Fell, Winifred Nicholson, Elizabeth Frink and Mary Fedden. She's also known for helping massively in the rediscovery of the work of Percy Kelly. I'm sure we'll talk about him loads today. My guest is a keen writer, which is something she decided to concentrate more on when she saw the gallery in 2012. Prior to that, in 2010, her book Hercules and the Farmer's Wife won the Lakeland Book of the Year Award, and in 2011, the biography of Percy Kelly, The Man Who Couldn't Stop Drawing, was published. She has written other books and publications, and also helped to establish the Percy Kelly Trails. She's curated exhibitions like the highly successful Percy Kelly exhibition at Tully House Gallery in 2018. So, after all that, I think it's time to introduce my guest now, Chris Wadsworth. Hi, Chris! Hello there, nice to hear you. Yes, very good. Everything okay with you up there? Great, yep. Very good. It's raining, mind. But, Is it? You know. Oh, it's sunny here in Manchester. It's not too bad. Uh, you know, <laughs> makes, it makes a change. Right, Chris, so today we're going to be talking about you and about Castlegate Gallery, which is the gallery, of course, that you started and everything that sort of went on from there, really. Um, So if we discuss, first of all, your early life, which I don't really know too much about, how did you become interested in art and what led you to opening a gallery, really? Oh, that's a difficult one. Well, I know. Well, Well, my early life, I was born in the east end of Sheffield. I was the daughter of a steel worker. Okay. And my mother didn't want me to go to art college. Well, she, she tried to stop me even passing the 11 plus but um, one wonderful teacher don't we all remember teachers sometimes that really <laughs> really helped us yeah. and this one was Mr Biggins who uh, actually managed to defeat my mother and I did pass the 11 plus although she stopped me going to school that day to even take it right. um, would you believe um, it just went on from there because I then realized there was another world and so on yeah. and I'd always loved art so that's where it took me. Yeah. You taught art, didn't you? Is that right? You taught art, did you? I taught art for for many years. Right. And then when we moved to the Isle of Wight, I did a bit of supply work, but I did a course in graphic design. Right. And that took me on the way. But I never had a, the thought of a gallery in right. my mind at all ah, until right. we moved to Cumbria. My husband took up a job in Whitehaven. Okay. And I was the one that had to find us a house. Mm-hmm. And we'd sold the house in Bristol. Oh, it was difficult. We, we kept losing houses. and there was, Yeah, there was that we were, the Bill Pease Good House, was it? I think that was one of them, it, wasn't it? Yes, it was. We looked at the Bill Pease Good House. We, we just kept losing houses. Nobody seemed to want to sell it. So we wanted a three-bedroomed house yeah. with a lovely view in the countryside. What we ended up with was Castlegate House, which is an eight or ten bedroom Georgian house. And it was weird, really. The agent sent us the details of this, which arrived one morning just as Michael was going to work. And he opened it up and went, oh, don't these agents listen? That's no good. It's a great big Georgian heat and chucked it in the bin. And after (laughs) after he'd gone to work... I fished it out the bin because I love Georgian houses. And yeah. I, I thought, you know, I'd given up a job, so what am I going to do today? I know, I'll go and look at this Georgian house. So I went and made an appointment to view, went along to see it, knowing that we weren't going to buy it. So all three kids had left home. 
wasn't going to buy it, walked in there and looked round, beautiful garden. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. Adam's ceiling and all the rest. I have a lot of work to do. Yeah. So it didn't really cross my mind. And then I wandered around the garden for ages. That's naughty, really, isn't it? Go to see a house when you've no intention <laughs> to buy it. People, a lot of people do it, though, don't they? Yeah. Well, they do, <laughs> but I didn't make a habit of it. Right. And it was just lucky that day that I did, because when I came back in from the garden, Simon Seckers, who was selling the place, one of the Seckers family, she said, oh, and you've got to come and look at the library. That was a bit pretentious. It was just like a room. Yeah. And I went into the library and thought, yeah, yeah, I'll then make my excuses and go. Yeah. And above the bookshelves, there was a Percy Kelly. <laughs> and it was a Percy Kelly of Parton. And I've been confused until a couple of years ago when I discovered that that painting was Parton. And it's now in the beacon. I never owned it. Right. I looked at that painting and I just said to Simone, who painted that? Very deadpan. Yeah. I thought, I'm not going to show I'm excited about this. Yeah. And she said, oh, a guy called Percy Kelly. And I said, oh, is he local? Oh, yeah, she said he lives in Workington. So I said, oh, right, on the coast, right. She said, yeah, he's a postman. And I thought, right, that's interesting. And I want some of his work. I want it, and I want it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I went off and had a cup of coffee and thought about it. And I thought, actually, that house would make a fabulous gallery. Wow. And I thought, but I'm not going to get this Prophet Michael because he's an economist and, you know, a, a sort of figures man. Yeah. But I remembered I'd been in the Midland Bank in Cockermouth and I'd seen a thing about how to write a business plan. And I thought, if I write a business plan, that was early in the week when I went to view, probably about Monday or Tuesday. And I thought, if I write a business plan and take him to view the house, we might just pull this off because I haven't <laughs> got a job up in Cumbria. So I did. I wrote a business plan for the first time in my life. Wow. And on the Saturday, I'd made an appoint a second appointment for second viewing. So they were quite excited at the other end. And I said to Michael, oh, I've got a house we might be interested in. And we got halfway up Castlegate because we parked in the town. We got halfway up Castlegate and he just stopped dead. And he went, oh, God, no, you, we're not going out with Georgia and Eve. But I said... Uh, yeah, but it's got a walled garden. Right. And he said, oh, right, it was a king garden. Ah, right, okay. So I said, so you are coming and we're not going to cancel. Come on. And we <laughs> went in and he wandered through to the garden and he went all dreamy-eyed. It was a lovely day and the roses smelled beautiful yeah. and the honeysuckle up the wall. And we went back in and he looked round very quickly and, uh, you know, off we went. We had a cup of coffee in the town. The coffee shops in the town were doing well. And I said to him, what do you think? And he said, well, it's like I've said, the garden is beautiful. I'd love it. But it's too big. Yeah. And I said, yeah, but I've got a cunning plan. And I produced my ah. business plan. <laughs> and he, he looked it through and he went, can you make this work? Right. And I said, oh, yeah, of course I can. Wow. <laughs> Lying through my teeth. And we put an offer in. It was exactly, the asking price was exactly the same as the terraced house in Bristol that we right. sold. Right. You know, that's what you get when you move north. Of course. And so then I started looking for Percy. I guess your life could have been completely different had you not bought Castlegate, because had you managed to buy, like, the Phil Pease Goods house or whatever else, I guess you actually having a gallery would never have probably entered your mind, um, and that probably never would have happened. No, I'd probably be doing B&B somewhere. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> or something like that. Crazy, so it? it really was a life changer, that was. Yeah. So Percy changed my life. But it did take me about four years to find him. Yeah. Because, in fact, by then, I thought he was a person in Workington called Percy Kelly. And, in fact, he was a recluse in Norfolk called Roberta Penelope Kelly. So my search was very difficult. And, in fact, I'm just making a YouTube. It'll go on the Percy Kelly website, website yeah. and so on and it'll have all the pictures and so on. It's just, it's called Pursuing Percy, and it's a four-year pursuit, really, of, of running him to ground. Right. That's and amazing. so that was really the start of the great adventure of all the rest of it, because everything else then just happened. Yeah, I mean, early on into the gallery, you were, you were hunting down, actively hunting down certain artists. Was it Karen Wallbank, I think, was one who you sort of had, you tracked down, I think? Um, yes, that was yes. It, early... She was a farmer's wife, yeah. She was a farmer's um, wife. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know. Well, 
it was a, it was a picture framer, a very good picture framer in a master picture framer in Kirby Lonsdale that told me that she'd come in. He gave me a ring and said, "Look, I've had this woman in, and she's a farmer, and her paintings are gorgeous. I think you should go and see her." And she she kind of turned me down. She was not ready for anything like that, and she was very very coy. She thought I was a con woman or. God knows what. Right. And I mean, she lived way up on the moors above Clapham in Yorkshire. Mm-hmm. She was in the forest of Boland, really. And I convinced her that, you know, I was real and I'd got a gallery. And it was the first time she'd shown work, really. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. And so you had artists that you obviously were tracking down, you were hunting, um, and then you were buying bits from auction as well. Is that right? It's a sort of, uh, did you have a mixture of artists that work that you picked up from auction that you bought privately and things like that as well? Not at that time. I right. haven't got any money. <laughs> <laughs> I had no money That's at all. Later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was selling on commission at the beginning. Right, the, okay. the auction business came later. That came later. Right. Okay. Uh, of buying things at auction and, I mean, I went, I went more and more up market. I never ever sold what you would call a local artist. Right. Although some of them lived locally, but I wasn't after Sunday painters or no, anything. And yeah. I just went up and up and up. Well, I grew in confidence and grew in wealth, I suppose. Yeah, okay. You know, at the beginning, I hadn't got two pennies to rub together because once we'd bought Castlegate and you know, made it livable in because yeah. it was it was very run down. And once I'd done that, I'd, I'd got no capital, really. The capital was the house that I'd put into business. Okay. And it was quite ironic that my husband had come up to run a bus company. And Thatcher at the time was privatizing national bus into yeah. separate companies. And he'd taken the opportunity of becoming chief exec of Cumberland Motor Services. Mm-hmm. And so we'd come up on that pretext. And of course, it's now history, but Stagecoach came in at the end right. and put in a bigger bid, so we're told. And um, he decided to resign. Right. Because he he didn't want to work for Brian Souter, <laughs> should yeah, I say? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if Brian Souter's listening. <laughs> but he really did not did not want to work for him at all. Right. So he just wandered in one day and said, "Right, a stagecoach have, have actually won the deal. They've won the company, yeah. and I've just resigned. Right. And I think I was I think I'd only just opened the gallery because wow. it took me a year to set it up. And do you know that made that gallery a success? Right. Because otherwise, I might have just doodled about with an course, income well. coming in, you know? You knew you had to make it work then, didn't you? Yeah, it really concentrated my mind totally. Yeah. And I just got on with it. I mean, there was no other galleries in the area, was there, I'm assuming, at that time in, in Cumbria? I mean, this is sort of the 80s, 80, 87 you opened up there, Castlegate. I opened up, yeah. Well, there were galleries, but there weren't galleries running like London galleries. Yeah, yes, basically. Time. You were, you were, like, having, you were wanting to start yeah. modern British, weren't you, as opposed to... Yeah. Yeah. local country scenes of Cumbria. Uh, uh, yeah, you were aiming yeah. yeah. And, and nobody was, apart from the big public galleries like yeah. Abbott Hall and Tully House, nobody was uh, running a, ga- a, a commercial gallery and having a programme for the year with different artists yeah. and having an opening, you know, and all that. The first opening I did, people got really dressed up. Did they? It was, it was a huge occasion. occasion <laughs> and I'd got no mail list because... We didn't know anybody in Cumbria when we yeah. moved in a year before. So it was it was locals, and of course there was no internet. Of course. We'd got, we'd got a little Amstrad computer. <laughs> I made this classic comment one day that I didn't think the World Wide Web was going to catch on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had no tools in that way. It yeah. was dependent on local people and their word of mouth. Yeah. And it, the word spread rapidly. And people got really doled up That's for the opening. People must have been looking at, you must have been looking forward to it. If, they knew you were, if it took you a year to do it, people must have caught wind that something was going on. It is quite a grand house in um, in Cockermouth. It's, it's, on the, it's on the top of the hill, isn't it? As you yeah. And so people oh, must have seen yeah. work going on and thinking, I want to go to that, you know, so they're excited about the whole thing. Yeah, well, it's such a beautiful house. With, yeah, it is, yeah. It you is. know, fabulous plaster work and, and so on inside. But the garden yeah. was just out of this world right. in that it was a walled garden. That's what sold it to Michael. Yeah. He said, you know, I've always wanted a walled garden, he said, dreamily. 
And I thought, I'm halfway there when we were looking. Yeah. And that was the break point for him, yeah. was this garden. And then, of course, he got the time to do it, yeah, which was wonderful. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah. So obviously, you were running exhibitions, you were sort of actively having these shows for various artists, and there's probably millions of artists that you could talk about, I would have thought. Um, but I think one of the things we will talk about, if that's okay, is, I mean, you, you did mention him a little bit early on, is uh, Mr. Percy Kelly himself. Um, <laughs> I mean, he is really somebody that has changed your life, and, and yet it's somebody that you actually, I know that you never met him. Um, you had letters, a couple of letters from him when you were trying to get him to show in your gallery, but which of which he obviously uh, refused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't sort of, he wasn't into that at all. Um, and so before we sort of go into the details, of it, could you, how would you describe Percy's work and what sort of, uh, it's probably hard for you to do that. What would you say draws you to his work in particular? You know, 99% of his work is on paper. It's mixed, maybe mixed media, watercolours and things. There's not really many oils around. Um, and so what sort of attracted you to his work? Difficult. The difference, <laughs> the difference. When you are surrounded by watercolour landscapes yeah. that paint it just like it is to the last leaf on the last tree and you get... There's a lake and a mountain, you know, and a tree, and that's that's it. His work is just so original. He he was a son of West Cumbria through and through, yeah. and he just painted West Cumbria like it is, which is grey yeah. and harsh, and it's linear. His work is very linear, yeah. but it's not absolutely factual. He will kind of maneuver things to make a beautiful, balanced painting. Um, and I've seen the effect of Percy Kelly mirroring the effect his first one had on me. Yeah. Because people just stop in their tracks mm. and just say, oh, who painted that? Yeah. And they're lost at that point. It's, it's, and it's it still is very happening. It's immediate, isn't it? It's incredibly immediate because, and it's very relatable from the very first moment you see it. He has a very strong use of line. He's clearly a very good draftsman. And, you know, the, the art, they do look topographical, but he has an incre he has a very good use of colour and, and tone, especially, I think. Um, so, yeah, he's, you know... Yeah, sort of, you know, yeah. You know. And it, it's all understated. Yeah, you know, true. his use yeah. of colour is understated, yeah. apart from a big red sun or a big yeah, red exactly. door. Yeah, exactly. You do get the, or you might get, like, a, re a red house that'll stand out in the distance as opposed... You know, everything else will be sort of toned in and there'll be this sort of dash of red or whatever colour that he'll use in the, in the distance. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, uh, so that's that's cool. And so, of course, um, with regards to Percy, was, well, was it Workington? I think he was born. Is that right? Is it Workington? Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, um, which which really is the pit. It, you know, it is the west coast. Right. Okay. And some of the other towns along the coast, they've got high viewpoints in. So he always liked to get to a high viewpoint and kind of look down. Uh -huh. In fact, sometimes he could levitate. He really could. I'm convinced <laughs> because he could he could actually be well up in the air and look down upon it and yeah. get it so beautifully perfect. But but Workington's not got a lot to commend it really because it's got no high points and yeah. it's you know streets and streets of terraced houses. So he didn't do a massive amount in Workington. 1918, he was born, wasn't he? I think is that right? And then uh, 1918, yeah. yeah. He was a twin, yeah. um, and obviously. He sort of was drawing from a very young age and had this natural ability to draw, basically, is what I think a, a gathering yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. He sort of, he didn't, but he didn't study, though, did he? At a young age, he didn't study art. He sort of had to go, he worked, worked straight away, wasn't it, from a very young age? Was he, yeah, from 14, 14 age 14. Right. Well, he, he won a handwriting competition right, at the okay. post office. The post office had this handwriting competition for kids at school. Okay. And he was at the secondary school in Workington, the central school. Yeah. Yeah. And he he had beautiful handwriting. I mean, it's copper plate, really is. And he won it, and he <laughs> got a place as an apprentice with the post office. Wow. Okay. okay. And he was po he was posted in Kendal at the post office in Kendal, yeah. and he used to cycle there. It's about forty miles from here, <laughs> from Workington, fifty miles, wow. I think. And he would cycle there, and he had digs. He didn't cycle every day. Yeah. He had digs in Kendall, and then he'd cycle back at the weekend. Right. Wow. Okay. And so he, he didn't have qualifications uh, until he went to Carlisle College of Art that was when he was older. 42. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so after Workington, what did he do then? What happened to him after Workington? Did where did he go? Did he, he moved around a little bit? Ah, war came along. Ah, of course. Uh, it yeah. was war. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. 1940. You see, 1940, what was he? He was 22. 22, yeah. And he and his brother 
went off to war right. uh, to join the border regiment. Yeah. But I'll give the army their due. They actually noticed almost immediately that Percy could draw. Right. Well, how would you miss it? Uh, because he took his stuff with him. The number of times he was told to send his drawing and painting materials home <laughs> were countless. Right. But he really impressed them because he was drawing all the time. And they put him in the Royal Signals and transferred him. And then they got him doing drawings and maps and things like that. Right. And he was in Derby for a while. Of course, that's where Rolls Royce was as well. Yeah. One, one of his majors or captains in his regiment had a Rolls Royce and found him drawing it one day. And he took him to the public school nearby and um, introduced him to the, the art master. Percy just impressed everybody yeah. he met. Yeah. You know, as soon as he took up a pencil and started drawing, yeah. people were transfixed. Yeah, he had this natural ability, didn't he? So I think that's what and when he came when he came back from the war, yeah. he wanted to then train to be a teacher, and the post office wouldn't let him. Right. There'd been so many killed in that war of course, yeah. that they they want to train people, and he had to go back to the post office. He was given um, a sedentary job rather than postman, and he hated it, and he didn't have time to draw or paint or anything. And he was he was really very, very unhappy. And he found that there was a post office going in Great Broughton, just near Cockermouth. By that time, he was married and had a young son. Right. And decided he'd go and be a postmaster. He was involved in the post office for quite a long time, wasn't he, I think? He uh, was, yes. The trouble was then, when he became postmaster, he went with his wife, Audrey, who didn't appreciate art at all. Right, Not okay. one iota. Right. And she thought art would, had to be a hobby, and she couldn't understand why, you know, he was painting and drawing all the time. He should have a proper job. Yeah. The trouble with the, with the post office was he was then self-employed, yes. and it was Audrey behind the counter, and Percy off drawing and painting. He did. He went off with Heaton Cooper for a while, <laughs> uh, learning things. They travelled about together, and his signature changed on the early works quite a lot are about now. He did spaced out capitals rather than the copper plate Percy Kelly. Right, okay. So he was signing like Heaton Cooper and he was painting like Heaton Cooper, which were the pale, literal landscapes. Yeah. And it wasn't until he had a, a big depression when he was running, when he was supposedly postmaster yeah. in Great Broughton, that he just thought, no, I, you know, I'm going to work bigger. I'm, and he just broke out in 1958. Right. He just broke out, got bigger pieces of paper, charcoal, and became the linear artist yeah, that we, we know Mandarin, today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Came I mean, prior to that, obviously, I don't know if it was prior to the war, he did, he did sell some of his work, didn't he? He did have a few exhibitions at Abbott Hall and a few other places. But I mean, he, he had really... one, only one exhibition at Abbott Hall. Just one exhibition at Abbott Hall. He did, I mean, there weren't many exhibitions at all, really, was there? Um... There were five in his life. Five, right. Oh, there you he go. had one at a gallery, the Fermoy Gallery in Kings Lynn. And that and Abbott Hall were the only two proper galleries he ever showed in. Right, okay. The others were Sir Nicholas Fecker in Whitehaven at the Silt Mills, who yeah. was also on the Arts Council and Glyndebourne and all that. He was a real man into the arts. Uh -huh. His design manager spotted Percy and really pushed him and introduced him to Sir Nicholas Seckers. Mm -hmm. And Seckers gave him an exhibition, his very first exhibition, was in the uh, foyer of Rose Hill Theatre in Whitehaven. Right. And then he took his work to their Sloan Street showroom and he had another exhibition there that Princess Margaret and Anthony Armstrong Jones came to. Right. And the fifth exhibition was when he was stuck in Norfolk and his second wife had left yeah, he needed him. the money then, didn't he? <laughs> and he needed the money yeah. and he still refused to. But Joan David, this wonderful saviour of yeah, Percy. Well, I was going to talk to you about, about Joan as yeah, well. Yeah, well, she persuaded him yeah. to have an exhibition that she curated. Uh -huh. She was in her 60s and she'd never done anything like it. She was a scientist, never done anything like it before. But she persuaded her neighbours at Troutbeck to let her have the house. And they did a sort of private exhibition yeah. there. And that was his first exhibition in his whole, life. his whole life. So obviously he was with... Um, 
he was with his first wife, is Audrey, I think it was his first wife, is that right? Yeah. Uh, so he was with yeah. her, and obviously she was becoming, I guess, more and more frustrated with the situation in the fact that he wasn't wanting to sell his work at that point, probably after the war. He was, he was painting, going off doing his own thing, and she was left uh, stuck in the post office working. But then he um, wanted to start studying as well, so he started a diploma, didn't he? An art diploma, I think he did in his 40s. That's right. Um, well, they moved to Allenby right. on the coast. Okay. which is a lovely, lovely place mm-hmm. on, on the coast. They managed to buy a Glen Cottage very cheaply, and he moved in, and he wanted to go to college. Yeah. It was Helen Sutherland, you know, the the, collect, the great collector, right. who moved over from the northeast to near to Oldswater. And, well, he was brought to her notice by Norman Nicholson, the poet, mm-hmm. in Milham, and she invited Percy for lunch, and she was a great influence in persuading Percy to go to Carlisle College of Art. I have the feeling she may have financed him in the first term because he couldn't get a grant. Right. Or in the first year. Yeah, he was too old, wasn't he, I think, at that point? He was too old. They they, they turned him down. He was 42. Or he was 41 when he applied and they turned him down. Mm -hmm. And I think Helen Sutherland, she was a great benefactor of working class artists. You know, the um, Pittman painters, Mm -hmm. she was the woman that in over in the northeast, of course, yeah. she was the one. She was the great um, benefactor yeah, of them, of course, yeah. you know. Of them, yeah, and he, she moved over to Cumberland, and so Percy was perfect material for her. Yeah, that's interesting. So of course, yeah. so he moved there, and obviously he was off doing this. And um, well, and Audrey obviously was still was working. They had a young child, and and Brian, I think it was. And then there was that one event, wasn't it? Was it the eventful evening when she came when she came home one night? Is that yeah, like, that's like a famous <laughs> tale, isn't it? I think you're better at telling. Where, where, so where this is which this was at Glen Cottage then, wasn't it? This happened in, in this the, was at Glen Cottage in Allenby. Right. Yeah. Okay. He'd gone off to college. Right. And then he'd been offered. You know, the college had thought he was going to go in for teaching. His final thing said he'd make a very good teacher. Right. And he just said to Audrey, no, I'm not going to do that. Right. And so she felt that he was just malingering. Yeah. She didn't appreciate the work. She got a job at Dovenby Hospital as a secretary, and he just wandered off every day. The, major- the mass of his work was done sort of during 19, 1960 through to 1970-odd. Right. And he was off every day. He left Allenby in 1971, I think. So she was there. She was. She's very bitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to go and see her in the old folks' home, and we used to have about half an hour of what Percy did wrong, you know, <laughs> for about half an hour. Right. And then her health for the next quarter of an hour, and then we might talk about, you know, yeah. general topics. Right. But she was very, very bitter about all this. Mm. She was hard done by, I'll give her that. Yeah. And he just wandered about yeah. drawing and painting all the time. And it, she could see no result from it, which there wasn't. Except that was the time when she showed, when he showed at Rose Hill Theatre. And she and he became part of the Rose Hill crowd. They were mixing with people. Mickey Seckers used to give a dinner after every concert. And... Percy went onto his invitation list, and he would would take obviously Audrey. They would go to the whatever it was, the the recital. And I mean, they had Dame Myra Hess. They had top top performers there. Right. And Mickey Sickers would throw a, a dinner afterwards in the house at the side, a big house rather like Castlegate. And Percy and Audrey would be invited. So she was mixing with, yeah. you know, the top of society. The Queen Mother, Percy sat next to the Queen Mother one, at one dinner. Uh-huh. And it just <laughs> seems incredible that a man who'd grown up, you know, in Corporation Road in Workington, with all these brothers and sisters, I think there were six or seven of them, yeah. one of them died, eight of them initially, could now be mixing with society with top performers and yeah, yeah. actors and people like that. But Audrey was still very, very bitter about it and sort of said, you know, art, I've had it up to here, she said to me several times. And she went, one day, Percy said to me when I was grumbling, because I think she nagged him like mad, and he went, look, they're, they're inviting you because I'm invited. And she said that was cruel, wasn't it? <laughs> but it was cruel but true. Yeah. He needed to said it, but there yeah. you are. But I think the final straw came. When she got home from work, having worked quite a hard day. What year was this been about? What what about? It was about 1970. Right. And they'd been in um, Allenby for about 10 years. 
and he finished at college in yeah. 64, 65. And she came home from work and she could see through the window as she parked the car that there, there was a, a fire on and she thought, oh good, Percy's home, he's lit the fire. We still, it was dark, it was winter. And she went inside and she wandered through to the sitting room and there was a woman in front of the fire that she didn't recognize with her back to her. And her hair stood on end of it. She thought, oh. So she said, excuse me, who are you? And the person turned round and held out a wand of mascara. And it was Percy. And said, could you help me put this on? I don't know how to do it. <laughs> and she said, she said to me, he was wearing my great Jaeger dress. Yeah. And so that was the final insult. Yeah. I said, what did you do, Audrey? And she said, I just told him to get out. Yeah. I didn't give him the chance to pick up anything. And she said, he hobbled out. He'd got my shoes on with the backs cut out. <laughs> she said, a pair of shoes that I'd thrown out. Yeah. And it, they were high heels and he'd cut the back out. And she said, he just disappeared into the night. Wow. And <laughs> that's always intrigued me. Where did he go? Yeah. He had to, actually had a car. They both had a car, right. even though it was early days. And I've found out since that he shared a studio over near Colbeck with a, a, a fellow graduate from Carlisle College of Art. Right, okay. And I think he drove over there. Right. It seems that was the logical thing. Yes. And she changed the lock. She got the lock changed that next morning, went off to work, told Percy that he would have to come in and get any, everything he wanted mm. because she was changing the lock at 12 o'clock or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And so he could only put in what he got in the car. Right. We lost a lot of work through that. She had a bonfire and all sorts. Oh, she destroyed a lot of it afterwards. Yeah, she oh, destroyed yeah. a lot of it. Right. Yeah. So then Percy was was on his uh, was on his own for well, I don't know how long he was. It wasn't not that long, I don't think, because he met he, he met another lady then, didn't he? Sort of soon after. I think. Yeah, he was yeah. on his own for about five minutes. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's very laughs> he needed somebody else to depend on, didn't he? I think. Um, oh yeah. You know, so that's met... why he was. That's why he was. So shaken yeah. when the second wife walked out on him, yeah, and she didn't so. walk out because of his transvestism. Yeah. It was poverty. Poverty drove her. Yeah, so he was with her for ten years or whatever. His second ten wife. or twelve years, and then yes, he, he uh, and eventually, this is was it Norwich that lived. Yeah, she'd had enough of the fact that he wasn't willing to sell anything. She could see no sort of you know point in anything or whatever and what he was doing and everything else. And then eventually, I think she just yeah, she just had enough, hadn't she? I think. I think she'd had enough. Yeah, she she went off to see her oldest son in, at college in Brighton, yeah. and he took her to the station at Attleborough. Mm -hmm. And when the phone went on the Sunday, he thought, oh, she's wanted me to pick her up at the station. And all she said was, that's it, it's finished. I'm yeah. not coming back. You'll never see me again. Goodbye. Yeah. One thing about Percy as well, you know, the people listening to this, there's so much you can find out about Percy. You know, go on the Percy Kelly website, there's loads of information, but there is books as well. There is, of course, Chris has written the biography of Percy Kelly, The Man Who Couldn't Stop Drawing. So it is worth picking these things up because there's so much things. I mean, they could make a film about Percy Kelly, about his life, I think. It's that sort of interesting. But obviously, he was on his own then. And then, then came the painted letters. I mean, obviously, there probably is a painted letter prior to that and so forth. But that's something that I associate with this time is that he's on his own. And, and sort of then he starts picking up these correspondence, doesn't he? These people who were writing to him. And he would write back sort of passionately with these letters, these illustrated letters that he wrote back to. Yeah. Them. Uh, yeah, beautiful letters. Yeah, that's it. And it was just that Joan David, his main correspondent, yeah. came in the gallery one day, and I'd been searching for Percy, and I'd actually met the second wife, and she wouldn't tell me where he was. Right. She said she didn't know. Um, this is why it took me three or four years to actually find him. Yeah. She was a potter then, and working as a chambermaid in hotels and things. Yeah. And Joan David wrote to him while he was still with Chris, before she'd actually left him. Ah, right, okay. But only a few months before. Right. She wrote um, 19... She just liked the work, didn't she, I think? She loved it. Yeah, yeah she no, absolutely she loved, loved it. it. Ask if she could buy one of his paintings, just a simple sort yeah. of, a simple yeah. letter to write to an artist, yeah. Yeah. And you see, that that's the thing with Chris, his second wife. She said afterwards, in retrospect, I think I fell in love with his work, you know. Right. And I can actually see that logically. Although he was a very, very attractive man. Mm. And he was tall and thin and, you know, very athletic and lovely, lovely looking guy. He was also, he had a sort of charisma. Yeah. He was just attractive mm -hmm. to women. Yeah. But she did say time and again, I don't know why I did it, you know, because I mean, I asked her, why on earth did you do that? And she said, well, number one, I thought I could change it. 
women, why don't we ever learn that we're not going to change them, are we? People are what they are, and you are not going to change yeah. them. But she thought she could, and that she could set up a gallery and sell his work, and it would be wonderful. It was cloud cooking land, really. Mm -hmm. And she just had year after year of hard labor, really. And she, she said, I fell in love with his work. Well, a lot of us did. And so did Joan David. Yes. She only met him five times. Right, wow. She said to me, if he'd lived any closer than Norfolk, yeah. she said it wouldn't have worked. He right. would have become dependent on me. Yes. And I didn't want that at all. The correspondence was lovely. Yeah. Because she got paintings, didn't she? Well, Even though he wouldn't sell things. Either. Just getting paintings three times a week. Some of these, these, these illustrated letters, people frame them and, and, and that's what they do. Oh, doing yeah. Things. Yeah, we, we had, after Joan died in 2000, uh, her family came to me and we had an exhibition. They were very sensible. Yeah. They put a core collection on one side. And that's now in the archive in Whitehaven, right. in the Cumbrian archive for people to go and look at. Yeah. But the others, they, they sold because there were so many. She got 1,500 or more wow. uh, of, of painted letters. And some of them were like 20, 30 pages long. God, must and have been it sometimes, every day. It must have been constantly yeah. writing. And sometimes he'd illustrate every page or yeah. he'd do little diagrams on pages. Yeah. And sometimes they were fabulous wonderful thing yeah. and so Percy kept Joan on a string because she was well aware that she was getting all these beautiful paintings and she was also one of the kindest people I've ever met right she mm. was so very very kind oh. she didn't do it just for, for the letters yeah. but the letters were a bonus of course I mean after after she did the exhibition at Troutbeck for him because otherwise he would have lost the house. Yeah, so, that's it. so she was corresponding with him I and mean, he was gradually sort of getting worse and worse. You know, he's quite a recluse and wouldn't exhibit anything and he was struggling. I mean, didn't he get admitted to hospital and it was malnutrition or something, I think? Stuff like yes, that. that's right. In fact, I've got the plate he decorated right by me now. Um, he, he had malnutrition. Yeah. They, they took him to hospital, did every test under the sun and that was the verdict at the end. He wasn't wow. eating anything. Yeah. And Every time they they then fed him up, did all sorts of, you know, calorific meals and so on. Yeah. And he would take the paper plate to the loo. He would wash it <laughs> in a basin. He got a neighbor to bring him his paints in, and he would then paint on the plate. Yeah. The, the, the plate. So that's what you mean by the man who couldn't stop drawing then, I guess, yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, he's in hospital, <laughs> he's got my nutrition, yeah. and he's drawing on a paper plate. <laughs> That's right, and it was the same in the it was the same in uh, the war in France. He was in the war signal, yeah. and they kept telling him to send his paints and everything back home. They were all small things he'd taken with him, you know, a little paint box and little bits of paper. He kept them in a, a first aid box yeah. with a with a white cross on, so nobody thought of looking in there. And there's one that we put in the retrospective, a painting of a cathedral that was semi-bombed. He did that, and he actually wrote on the back of it about the bombing that was going on at the time. And he just, just could, yeah, could not, yeah. a day without drawing or painting, he knew it would push him over the edge. He would, he, he got depressed, yeah. and badly depressed, properly, clinically depressed. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. If he didn't get the chance to yeah. so, draw. So she, so she organised this exhibition for him, um, which was the last, like we say, like you said, the last one in his lifetime, just to sort of raise some funds so he could survive, I suppose. She, yes. Yeah, yes. And it was his last visit to Cumbria. Right. Because okay. he actually, she, <laughs> she got rail tickets. Because Attleborough is on the main line station. You know, it's on the main London line. Yeah. And it's very well placed. And it's only a few miles from his cottage there, Pear Tree Cottage. And so she, she organized it all that he could come up on the train and he refused point blank. He couldn't do it. Yeah. So she was a bit stumped. So she said, well, look, just use the ticket to Manchester and I'll get somebody to pick you up. I'll come myself or somebody. No, that wouldn't do. <laughs> so in the end, she got the owner of the beautiful house, Kringlemere, at uh, Troutbeck. She persuaded him to go down to Petri Cottage at Rockland St. Peter in Norfolk yeah. and pick Perty up. <laughs> and he came back with one hell of a story because he had a beautiful car, a big black Bentley, yeah. and he turned up at Pear Tree Cottage. And that's when Percy brought out all these boxes, box after box after box. 
Yeah. And the last thing was a bird cage with his budgie in. And that went <laughs> in this beautiful, immaculate Bentley. And then he started nailing up the windows. He, I think he'd mentally lost it by yeah. then. Yeah. And so this poor man turned up. <laughs> uh, Joan, Joan put him up in her beautiful pink guest room. Yeah. This car drew up. She lived just up the hill from Kringlemere. And out came Percy, and then out came all the boxes. Mm-hmm. And the last thing to come out was the bird. <laughs> How long would he stay in there for? <laughs> it's crazy, isn't I it? I think he was there about two weeks. Right, okay. Because he had to be there for the opening yeah. and all the hanging and everything. Yeah. And wow. she woke up in the middle of the night one night, and she could hear all this hammering. Because yeah. he brought all his tools. Right. And he was, <laughs> uh, she'd got everything framed. And she heard all this racket going on, and she came down, and he'd taken one of his paintings out of this beautiful frame that she'd paid for from this guy nearby who was a very good framer, and he was just bodging together a a frame of his own, and she was furious. And she said she almost finished writing to him after that exhibition. It was so wearing. A lot of people, the people who owned Kringlemere, they bought quite a few works. Right. And he didn't take any discount off for them. And they had lent him their house. Yeah. And their gardener was a lovely man, and he'd hung the whole exhibition. And he bought one too. Mm. And afterwards, Joan just told him off and said, you write to all these people, you know, and say thank you. Yeah. And so on. What they've done for you yeah. is wonderful. It was reversed to them more, wasn't it, as well? Well, he... Totally, no. Right, um, okay. He used to go to Attleborough as Percy. Okay. And he used to go to uh, Watton uh, as Roberta. As Roberta. And he used right. to get them mixed up. And there was a, a nearly new shop in Watton. And the women there were very, very sympathetic to him. And they helped him find stuff and admired him and all the rest of it. Yeah. And he used to get all his women's clothes there at the nearly new shop because he'd got no money. Mm-hmm. I mean, Joan got him a supplementary benefit. He'd not paid his insurance at all uh, since he left working for the post office, really. Right. He'd not paid his, his national insurance. He was freelance when he, when he was postmaster. Right. So he hadn't paid anything into anything. Yeah. So he got no pension. No pension yeah. And she managed to get him a supplementary benefit. Right. She was wonderful. Yeah, she Joan. really, she really was. She has. So, of course, you, she, you met her in the gallery and then you obviously you know, you, you expressed your love for how much you loved his work. And then obviously you learnt more of his story from her. Uh, and then you yeah. wrote to Percy to say, I've got this gallery, trying to get him to maybe show some work, which he kind of shut you down and then didn't want to sort of know about that. There's a very famous line in one of your letters that you received from him about him being more interested, perhaps, in how he was viewed after his death. Um, I can't remember exactly yeah. that line. Um, you you yeah. might be able to quote it <laughs> better than me. I'd rather starve than sell one piece of my work. Yeah. But after my time, I want people to wonder yeah. at the beauty and truth that I have portrayed. Yeah, there you go. That's it. That's and it. he said to Joan one day in a letter, just imagine it, that you and I are going to be very famous because people will make pilgrimages right. to this letterbox. That was that was on the beautiful one he did of the red letterbox yes. that was built into a, a, a hedge of ivy right. just down the road from Pear Tree Cottage. Yeah. And he painted that and then said, you know, people will make pilgrimages. Yeah. to this letterbox. Right. And in fact, some people do. I know the people <laughs> right. that now live, they now live in Pear Tree Cottage. Right. And they made contact with me for a long time. They didn't know who had lived there. Yeah. And uh, because there was an intermediary buyer. And one day the door went and these people, two women were standing on the doorstep and they said, is it, you know, is this Pear Tree Cottage? And he said, yes. And they said, well, can we come in and look round? And he said, well, why? And they'd got the book of painted letters. And they said, well, because Percy Kelly lived here. And this guy had never heard of Percy wow. Kelly. And nor had his wife. And they then realized that, you know, something interesting yeah, had happened, happened at that place. And in fact, they bought one or two Kellys too. Right. Especially ones that are interiors of the cottage of or course, whatever. Right. I've been to Castlegate on a few occasions, um, and I've got my, my kids here, a couple of kids, and we did a little um, pilgrimage, if you like. We went to Workington, and we, I got photos of the kids outside his house and all the rest of it, and yeah, we did do a bit of that, um, sadly. <laughs> but it was, just, it was just nice to do. And then the other one, this is an artist that we maybe speak about in a minute, because I think most of this conversation is obviously about Percy, but we will talk about a few other things as well. But, um, oh, good. <laughs> but um, we went to uh, Aspatria as well with regards to Sheila Fell, and we, 
we saw that the, the plaque where it's there and went and stood outside a house and all that sort of carry on. So there you go. We'll talk about that later on. So you, you obviously write into Percy and that didn't happen. And then what happened was he died, didn't he? Was it 1993? I think he died. 93, died? yeah. 93. Yeah. And so there was a whole story, which again, like I say, I will say to people, you know, there is a very good chapter in Hercules and the farmer's wife about it, about pursuing Percy. What happened, you know, in the short version, if you like, is that something happened at the funeral. Um, his son appeared, who nobody really knew that much about. And he obviously inherited everything simply because there was no will that could be found, I think. I think originally the paintings were perhaps promised to Joan and that didn't sort of materialise. Yeah. And so obviously yeah. he inherited them. And then there was a bit of things going on with regard to what was going to happen to the paintings because he didn't, Brian, who obviously had not seen his father for years and years and years, he didn't know what was going to happen. They might end up getting destroyed. There was all these things going on. So obviously that had all happened. And eventually you managed to convince Brian that it is worth his while getting his paintings up to you. And so you went, you arranged a courier, is that right? Who, who went and picked them yeah. up and, and what happened with that? With regards yeah, to that? yeah. I'll just add here, I'll, I'll do a little, a little ad in the middle because it, this that I've written about in, in my next yeah, yeah, piece yeah, of video, really. Yeah, yeah, next yeah. video talk. And I've got into the details of how Brian was persuaded uh, oh, to brilliant. let me, let me send a courier down yes. to Petrie Cottage. And my instruction was to the owner of the business that he'd just got to bring everything up that was art because he was an art courier. Yeah. And in fact, when he arrived in Castlegate Car Park with the van, it was a great big van. It was a big transit. Yeah. And in fact, he got two tapestries from the V&A that were on their way to the laying in Newcastle. Right. And there were four wrapped oil paintings that were, had come from the Tate yeah. And we're on their way to Edinburgh yes, to the Scottish Academy. <laughs> yeah. And so my instruction was, he was coming up from London and the, the owner of the business, Roy, said, oh, yeah, I'll get Jack to kind of divert off the M1. I'll let him divert off, you know, we'll pick it up. What do you want him to bring? Yeah, Norwich, I said, Look, he went to Norwich then. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm not allowed to go to the cottage or anything. The son won't let me. He's yeah. a bit like his dad. I said, but I want everything bringing up. So it was arranged that he would come up on the following Wednesday. Yeah. And we thought he might arrive sort of mid-afternoon. And mid-afternoon came and went. And tea time came and went. And it got began to get dark. It was summer. So it didn't get dark till quite late. And it was just going dark at about nine o'clock okay. when the van came into the car park. And I, I sort of clicked the kettle on because I thought Jack would want a cup of tea or something. I went to the door and Jack came in. I said, look, I'll give you a cup of tea. And I poured him that. And I said to him, how have you got on? And he said, oh, it's terrible. I've had a terrible day. And I said, what's happened? And he said, oh, God. He said, how much have you insured this all this stuff for? Right. And I said, that's not in your business, Jack. <laughs> I said, I've arranged it with your boss man. Yeah. And he said, no, but what have you insured it for? And I said, well, I don't have to tell you. It's all right. I said, I had a difficulty knowing because I've not seen it. He said, I know you haven't. And I said, I put 40,000 on it. And he said, what, 40,000? <laughs> he said, it's a load of bloody rubbish. Oh, no. At which point, I just, my hair stood on end. Yeah. And I thought, oh, God, this man's used to carrying art about. Yeah. You know, he, he, he's probably right. And I said, okay, sup up, tea, I'm out in the car park. Come on, yeah. now. And I'd got Michael, my husband at the time, before my husband died, and we went out in the car park in the dark and he let down the tailgate yeah. and the doors opened and it was horrendous what met my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> you could see the things neatly wrapped leaning against the wall at yeah. either side and then just this load of stuff. Oh, it was, oh, overflowing bread trays of stuff and old paint cans and everything yeah. under the sun. It just looked terrible. Yeah. And I, I, he said, I told you, I'm, I'm sorry. And I, I just jumped on up the tailgate and I just lifted the top piece of paper on one of the bread trays and it still hits me now. Right. I've got tears coming into oh, my right. eyes now. <laughs> it was this painting right. of Lowswater. And it was backed by a newspaper. He often used to paste a newspaper on the back of a painting okay. if it was on board. And it, it just looked like a tatty old newspaper. I turned it over and it was it was Lowe's water. And I, I just started. Oh, the wow. tears just came. <laughs> and I picked the next one up and it was that fabulous one of the 
boats in in Whitehaven yeah. Harbour oh, with a big yeah. red sun. And I just flicked through about four. And there were just tears streaming down my face. And Jack came up, jumped up onto the onto the tailgate, and he put his arm around me. And he said, I knew you'd be upset, love. Oh, he no. said, don't <laughs> cry, don't cry. And I just looked at him, yeah. and the tears came again. <laughs> and he said, come on, we'll go and have a cup of tea. Yeah. And he got down, and he handed me down. And I just got over him, <laughs> and did a bit of a jig. And I said, Jack, it is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And he yeah. went, it's what? And I said, come on, if, you, if you'll help me unload it now and Michael. I said, we've got to take it up to the studio at the top of the house. Yeah. I said, I'll make you bacon sandwich. Oh. And he said, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and we all laughed. We were hysterical by then. That's amazing. And I mean, we that, could, that's we what can happen with work on paper. Off. That's what can happen yeah. with work on paper. He's an artist that I, I'm a massive fan of, um, a guy called Arthur Berry, and sort of 99% of his output is on paper, and it's very easy to just have a big pile of paper all stacked up and not realise, actually, once you put it, lay it all out, and you know, and it's people that used to seeing paintings on canvases and on board and in fancy frames and everything, and so just literally a pile of paper doesn't look like anything, does it? Until you sort of no, it into, doesn't. Yeah, no. exactly. And of course, once you actually unearth, you just dig through it and you start separating things, you can, you know, so it's just, it's just knowing what you're looking at. And I guess when he was at this house, there must have been that much other stuff in the house. If it was, it strikes me, he was probably quite a collector, I would imagine, per se. So, well, it was, he was, yes. Yeah. And of course, Brian was looming round and about because Brian had never, Brian Kelly had never owned property in his life. Right. He'd Perfect left school summer. at 14, he'd, he'd joined the Merchant Navy. Yeah. He'd gone round the world sort of uh, in the job. And when he got back, his dad had gone. Yeah. And he never saw him again. Right. Uh, 20, 27 years. And suddenly, he's inherited a cottage. Yeah. You know, it was it was full of purses, do it yourself, bodge. <laughs> um, but everything looked to him like rubbish, yeah. just as it did to Jack. You know, it was obvious that they weren't used to looking at stuff in bread trays on paper. Of course, yeah. And so, well, Joan and I were having fits, I'll tell you, <laughs> because we knew how how Brian would think that he'd got to clear the house to make this capital. In the end, it took three years to, to sell that house, really? you know. Right. Yeah. There you go. And the, and the thing that changed Brian, I mean, he, he came to see me. Joan wasn't, she'd had a hip replacement. And so she organized everything and found where Brian was and where his mother was and yeah. all the rest of it. And sort of made Brian come to the gallery to see me. And he was very, very uncomfortable. And he saw me as a right posh woman. <laughs> and the gallery was, you know, really, he was not comfortable in it at all. And when I said, you know, really, your dad's work is worth an awful lot of money worth far, far more than Pear Tree Cottage. He just clearly didn't believe me. Yeah. He just didn't. He just thought this woman was stupid. Yeah. You know, she's she's a rich kid and she's stupid and all the rest of it. He he just had no concept. Of course, yeah. But it was something quite different that changed his mind. It wasn't me. It wasn't you. All <laughs> oh, right, okay. It wasn't me. <laughs> and it wasn't Joe. Right, okay. do, do you want to know what, what changed his mind? Go on then, yeah, of course, yeah. Well, they were still doing probate. So this is obviously and after Percy died, he's still doing probate. And, and Yeah, they were doing okay. probate. There was no will, there was, but there was no money, there was no nothing. Yeah. And nobody declared paintings as probate. Okay. Because nobody valued them. And they were valueless. They were just bits of paper in boxes. Yeah. And the whole place was like Anna Hawkeswell's house, you know, a house that was floor to ceiling with paper. So the probate did not take into account any paintings. Nobody round and about knew that he was an artist even. Right. And there were some people nearby, a gentleman farmer and his wife, very nice people called Raleigh. They're now Lord and Lady Raleigh, but right. um, at that <laughs> time his dad, Lord Raleigh, was alive. And they were decent people that took Percy under their wing and would help him. It was David Raleigh that took his paints in when... Percy was in hospital, and it was David Raleigh that was with Percy when he died. Right. He was eaten and Oxford educated, and they're not really into the arts at all. Okay. And so he'd no idea that Percy's work could be worth that much. But I think after probate was settled, Brian decided to go down and look at 
you know, his newly acquired property. Yeah. And the, the Raleigh's were very kind to him. They offered him one of their cottages on the, on the farm that they used to let out, that he could stay with his lovely wife. I got on very well with Brian's wife. They had no children. Okay. But she seemed to have a lot, she was very sensible. She seemed to have a lot, a lot more going for her. Yeah. And they stayed in one of the cottages. I didn't know this until about two years after I'd got the work, but I think Brian had mentioned to David that there was this woman that said the work was worth a lot of money. Yeah. He didn't say who the woman was or a gallery yeah. or anything. He just said, somebody's told me that, that they the work here. Yeah. And so David said, right, let's just see. I've got a chum that works for Phillips Auctioneers in London, and he's probably here this weekend because Brian could only go down at a weekend because he, he was working in a factory yeah. in Villa. And he said, let me ring it and see if he's in. He said, and we'll, we'll take something to show it. So we rang this friend who'd worked for Phillips the Auctioneers in London. And this guy was just off out fishing and was a bit put out. But, you know, the old boy network means that you, if you want a favor, you'll do it. And he said, well, you know, how much stuff is there? Oh, well, the cottage is full of it. Well, tell him to bring four pieces. So they just picked four pieces at random and put them in the car. Yeah. And Brian wouldn't even get out the car at the other end. Right. I think he was intimidated just totally by the whole thing, you know. Yeah. And so David Raleigh went in with these four pieces and the Phillips guy looked. They were just plonked down on the kitchen table. And he said, uh, who owns this? And David said, well, his son, he's died and his son's inherited. This guy said, well, how much stuff is there? And David said, well, the whole cottage is full of it. Right. And he said, well, where is this son? And David said, well, he's out in the car. He won't come in. So he said, well, bring him in. <laughs> so David went out to the car and brought Brian in, who immediately became really servile. Apparently, he was calling yes, sir, no, sir. Right. And so the Phillips man, I've never found out his name or anything. The Phillips man said, where does your father come from? What are all these paintings of? Yeah. And he said, Cumbria, sir. And he said, right. Brian didn't know there were quite a few of St. Ives and yeah, Cornwall yeah, yeah. and all yeah. that. And he said, Cumbria, sir. And so this guy looked at him and said, you need to take these back to Cumbria. There's a very good gallery started there, he said. <laughs> it's called Castle Gate something. Yeah. And Brian apparently gained in height. He was quite a tall yeah, guy, yeah. his father. And he sort of stood up straight and said, I have been there, sir. <laughs> and I know the woman there, sir. Her name is Chris. Yeah. And so Phillips, thank you, God, said, yeah, yeah. get it back up there. And that's that. why yeah. the following weekend, Brian walked in and said, I'm going to bring Dad's work back up here. Yeah, that gave him the confidence then, didn't it? Of course, that changed yeah. it off. Wow, that was good. And he never told me what had happened right. at all. It took me another two years or more when I, I met David Raleigh and I found out that that, that conversation had taken place. Right, well, there you go. And okay. you see, I then said to Brian, how do you want to get the work up here? And he said, oh, at me, 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 me. <laughs> And I just looked and I went, you need a van. Yeah. And I put it to him and I said, can I send a proper courier yeah. van down there? And he said, how much will it cost? And I said, I will pay for it. And he looked petrified. And I said, no strings attached, Brian, to get it back to Cumbria. I don't care what you do with it. Well, I do. But, you know, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Let's get it back yeah, to get Cumbria. It first. And I said, and where? Do you want it to go with my fingers crossed behind the back? Yeah. And he said, oh, I'll take it to me. And his lovely ginger-headed wife sort of looked at him in horror. And I said, and where will you put it at home? He lived in a council house on the airfield at Villa. Right. And he said, oh, well, well, out and under bed. <laughs> at which point, Doreen looked at him and said, Brian, you yeah. cannot do that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And at that point, I said, can I take you somewhere? Just come up here with me. And we went up to the studio at the top of the house. Just a very big room, the size of yeah, the of rooms course, downstairs yeah. all put together. Of course, yeah. And I said, look, if, if the work comes here, I can then get photographers to photograph every piece 
and I will have two photographs taken of every piece. So we've both got a set. Yeah. And then I will sort through it, and then I'll invite you and Doreen to come and have a look, and we'll decide what to do next. Mm. And so it came to pass. And that's what happened. That's it. And that's it's it. just amazing, really. Yeah, it's just, I mean, really, when that, that happened, when it all landed uh, with you, you'd obviously seen a number of Percy's works, but you must have been, it must have blown your socks when you saw, I mean, obviously, this is all stuff that had never been seen before, never been documented. It was just like, you know, That's, it was like every Christmas at once, wasn't it, really? It was like, oh, well, <laughs> do you know what, I, do you know the first thing I did? Go on. Well, Joan was out of hospital. Yeah. But she couldn't drive. She couldn't do stairs. She'd had this big double hip replacement. I'd got somebody who knew of Percy when he, he was down there living in Kendall for a short while at Levens. Somebody, a GP's wife, uh, Mavis Aitchison. Yeah. Mavis said she would drive Joan up to the gallery because I thought, Joan can't miss out on this. I owe everything to Joan. Yeah. And so Mavis drove her up to the gallery and my husband Michael carried her up the stairs. Wow. To the to the attic or the studio at the top, yeah. and we had a day bed put up there. We had lunch up there, like a picnic lunch. Yeah. And Mavis Aitchison and I picked up one by one. It was just like the Royal Academy Selection Committee. We marched past <laughs> loads and loads of pieces of work, yeah. and she lay on the day bed, and she just she just loved it. Oh, that was nice. my crowning moment, really, yeah. more than anything else. That it was Joan that was responsible for all of it, really. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, without her, Brian would have had the bonfire to end all bonfires yeah. in I mean, the garden. It's strange isn't how these how things can happen. These certain, you know, things always lead to something else, and it's just sometimes they, they go the right way, and obviously that's what happened. After Joan had had her walk past as many as we could physically walk past her, yeah. and she was totally overcome. Um, I then invited Brian and Dory come in and see. I was I had a photographer in taking everything. I was going to present Brian with they were slides, you see. We we were on slides then and professional photographers. Yeah. All I'd got was a Polaroid camera <laughs> and we would decide what to do. Yeah. It was quite an auspicious day. Did they document the house at all at any point then? Was there any photographs at that point or anything like that before anything was I mean, it no, like and that. I never managed, no, and the house wasn't, they didn't do a brochure or anything. Yeah. It took three years to sell the place. Right, okay. And then it took, a, it, I, actually the Raleigh's bought it right. and renovated it as a holiday cottage. And there are no photographs. I asked the people who had bought it from the Raleigh's whether they would got any photographs. Yeah. And they hadn't, but they bought it as a holiday cottage. Okay. And they bought it not realising at all. And I said, did you see any, any photographs of how it was? When, uh, no, of course not. Yeah, you know, not and, and nor of the Raleigh's. I've met the Raleigh's a couple of times since, and they didn't have any photographs of it. Right, okay. So it's a shame. I, there are all sorts of things I wish I'd got. Yeah, I mean, you, you obviously got a lot of stuff, obviously a decent sort of collection of his work left behind. Uh, so subsequently after that, you had a few exhibitions of his work. All you, sta you staggered it, didn't you? You did this 10-year plan with Brian and you staged a few exhibitions, one every couple of years, which were all, you know, sell-out shows, people queuing up overnight, you know, days before the shows, <laughs> trying to get the work. Yeah. Um, it went, yeah. it kind of went bananas, didn't it, really, with the uh, with his popularity? It uh, did. Yeah. And when the Beacon opened in Whitehaven in, uh, ooh, I've got the dates, somewhere 98, possibly, um, I did a, a Kelly show there right. in their new purpose-built gallery. I did a show, uh, two shows at Messons in Cork Street. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, I think I've yeah. seen, um, I might have been there at the same time that you was there a few years ago because they have they had this Northern exhibition on and I think they had some of Percy Kelly's in that show. Um, so we may, yes, they we did. May have been at the they same did. Show. It was the first one that they did that David Messon did was a Northern um, Not Elemental Northern North show. or something? Is it Elemental? Elemental North, you've got it, yeah. yeah. Right. And then he published, they've got a publishing arm, and they published The Man Who Couldn't Stop Drawing For Me. Right, and okay. we had a big solo show, and then we had another solo show. And then that that was that. He'd love it now, but there, there's not enough left to go and do that. Really. No, no. And so obviously you had these selling, selling exhibitions. Brian was was getting some huge checks, I would have thought, at that time from, from all this, this work that was selling. And then he died, didn't he, during possibly it was the last one, was it? I think he died. Yeah, he died, in, the, in the fifth exhibition, Brian died, Brian died of, of alcoholic poisoning, basically. Wow, okay. right, right, and right. he was on drugs. I mean, I, I gave him a lot of money from, well, I didn't give him 
I, I made a lot of money for it for him of course, yeah. through his father's work, yeah. and I could see what was happening, right. and it was very difficult to kind of deal with that yeah. because anything I said would seem as though I was self-interested yes. or something like yeah, that. Of course, yeah. It was very very difficult. I did manage to broach with him about the will yeah. as he went downhill more and more, and one day I got him on his own, and I said to Brian, you know. Have you made a will? Because, you know, you're now a man of some means yes. and so on. I, I tried to put it that way, yes, of course. you know, and you need to make a will. And he said, no, and he just looked blank at me. And then oh, a few months later, he came in and said very proudly to me, yeah, I've, I've made a will. Right. And I said, brilliant. Congratulations. I'm not going to ask you what you. Oh, no. He said, I'll tell you. I've left it all to me, mother. Right. And I thought, oh. Yeah. The first rule of making a will is yeah. leave it to somebody younger yeah. so than that's probably, that was per, That's Percy's first wife then, isn't it? That was yes, Audrey. Yes. Audrey, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Audrey, who, who destroyed so much. Who destroyed so much, oh God. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Starts again. <laughs> I know, I know. Right, okay. When you eventually sold Castlegate, I think after 25 years, you continued on with Percy from then, and you are still continuing on with Percy and... You sort of keep in- I am now. I, I still sell them um, every now and again yeah, from that. my own collection. Oh. Or I actually now own the copyright. There are a lot of clowns, you know, that try and sell reproductions on eBay and that sort of thing. Yes. And, you know, at 40 quid a pop and all this sort of stuff. And the people now, I mean, Audrey's died long ago. Her niece has inherited and they're not capable of copyright and stuff like yeah. that, chasing things up. And so, in fact, I manage the estate for them. I see. Okay. And, um, so you just have to make sure everything's all proper. And I, I do that at, utterly voluntarily yeah. because, uh, you know, I, I really do care about yeah, it all these pa- years. It's a passion, isn't it? I've it's a passion. lived with it, you know, all this time. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I want to see it through, really. Well, I like that. I like you've done things like you've done the trails and things like that. That's brilliant. I love stuff like that. That's sort of, I'm a big fan of things like, you know, things like that where people get out and they can see what, you know, what influenced Percy and, and or any artist really? So that's the trails that you've done is really good, and uh, and obviously in 2018 there was a huge, there was a big exhibition at Tully House that you were heavily involved with. I think you curated that, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. I curated it. That was a big show. That was I mean that there's, there was a lot of uh, publicity at the time for that show. I remember, and it was I mean Massive th- thousands it, yeah. went to see it, didn't they? I think it was a yeah. Popular. Melvin opened it for us because Melvin, you know, he wouldn't sell to Melvin Bragg right, when okay. Melvin. <laughs> drove up twice right. um, and that was lovely because I'd got some of Melvin's letters right. and some of the letters that Melvin had returned okay. written back to Percy right. and that was really good we yeah. put them all in a, in a display case That's nice. and that was really nice that Melvin appreciated that and uh-huh. so on because he good. doodled on the letters on the letters that that, uh, Percy, that Melvin had written back to Percy right. saying could he come back again and he really liked this and he really liked <laughs> that and Percy had just doodled Melvin Bragg all over it in <laughs> sort of red and black and things like this right. really quite funny that he'd filled in you know like as a kid you'll fill in letters yeah. and things yeah. along the way he'd, he'd done all that sort of doodle stuff on it yeah. and so Melvin opened it for us and we I think they got more than 12,000 yeah. paying people through, yeah. apart from school visits, yeah, you yeah. know, and all that sort of thing. And the opening, which was by invitation and so on, yeah, they cool. got well over 12,000 people yeah. through the doors. Well done. That was, uh, that's and it was good. And then, of course, we followed it with a legacy exhibition of Percy's work. You know, there's so many coincidences with Percy and his, his life as it goes on in death. Yeah. Um, a lovely solicitor from Ipswich used to come up to the gallery and in the end he bought, when he retired, he bought himself a house, in, a little house in Keswick. Mm-hmm. And he used to come and see us at the gallery and he bought all sorts, he bought sedans, he bought some really good works and he owned, I think, 12 or 14 Kellys. Right. And he came to me one day, a lot of people do this now and say, what should I do with my Kellys? You know, the kids don't want them or I haven't got any kids or whatever. Mm-hmm. David, David Heckles never married. And he came and asked me and I said, well, leave them to Tully House. Right. Because I knew in my mind that I was going to approach them. This was long, long before David died, that I was going to approach them for a retrospective one side sold the gallery mm-hmm. and I thought that's my next thing that's my next aim and I David actually <laughs> yeah he came up to the retrospective he was such a modest little man 
he didn't tell me he was coming or anything. It was sheer coincidence as I walked through the, the lobby and he was just sitting there on one of the settees. And I took him for lunch into the restaurant. And then we went round together. And he was obviously not well at all. Right. But he was he made it up and he'd come on the train and all the rest of it. And he actually died on the last day wow. of the retrospective. Yeah. It was just such a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. I got home. I was exhausted. It was a Sunday. And I got back home and there was a message. There was an email waiting for me by a great friend of his, Hannah, who had been with him when he died because he'd got nobody. Yeah. And she said, oh, what are we going to do about you know the work she's left? And so we organized all that. And I wanted a big cross made of this guy that had left all this valuable stuff to Tully House. Yeah. And so at that point, I said it would have been Percy's 100th birthday in November 2018 would have been the centenary of his birth. Yeah. And we organized an exhibition called Legacy. Yeah. And we showed David Heckles. And then, it's amazing what then came out the woodwork, because Joan David's son and daughter decided, well, I think it was his son and wife, yeah. in Kendall decided that they would give some of Joan's letters and one or two of her paintings to Tully House. Yeah. And then the children of, the stepchildren of Percy, who were Chris's children, the second wife, they'd got quite a lot of stuff. And, and his, her widower, Michael Mills, he was her third husband, and he brought a box of stuff to Tully House. Well, he brought it to me, and I said, take it to Tully House. Yeah, yeah. He took that to Tully House. When I looked through it, I'd got things that related to unfinished stuff mm. that he brought. So I gave them about 10 pieces. Right. So it made a very good exhibition. Yeah, of and of course, it set off a whole new collection yeah. for Tully House, which I hope will continue. That's nice. That's very good. And the, That's yeah, a good legacy. And, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so it, it kind of rounds off the story, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with you, with Percy, you do, it just keeps on going, doesn't it? I mean, it's in the 80s, I think, when you first sort of, well, it was the 80s, wasn't it? And you were looking at his work yeah. originally, and it's all, and even now you're sort of still doing talks and things and exhibitions, and it's, it's a fantastic sort of thing. It's yeah. been with you for such a long time. Yeah. Um, and people, have, are coming, people are coming from all over to do the trails. I've right. got a man that comes from Brittany every year, and he does different trails. Brilliant. You know? They're really it's, good. It's That's a really good idea. Incredible. To yeah, yeah. Fantastic. yeah. And the book now, the painted letters of Joan's letters, yeah. it's all coming true, you know. Um, it was quite a long run. It was published by a London publisher. Okay. And he's not going to do a rerun. But those painted letters are selling the books now. Oh, the books are for the yeah. They go for fortune. I, 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 I watch them. I see the book on Amazon, and it's like bloody. It's, uh, yeah. The, well, the guest who was on the first podcast, Peter Davis, he had his Northern School book. Um, before he did another copy of it, the original version of it was going for crazy money. You know, people were paying quite high money. You know, high money for it because it was a very limited run. But yeah, I would sort of suggest if anybody is interested in learning more about Percy, then yeah, there's, there is a lot of publications out there that you can do. You can go and you can even go and do the trails, I suppose, if you're that yeah. way inclined. But yeah, so that's. I think we'll sort of. We'll say the end of that with Percy for now. <laughs> we could literally be talking forever. Um, I'll try. <laughs> it, I'll, it might be worth do, going into another episode with regards to because I'll, I'll mention it quickly. I'll try an overview of it because obviously at Castlegate, one of the things that you did manage to do at Castlegate was you had an exhibition of L.S. Lowry's work, and obviously I'm, I'm a massive L.S. Lowry fan. Um, so you managed to do that. That was in 2003, I think it was. Your show. Uh, yeah. And that brought together quite a, well, it was quite a, you know, substantial number of works. I mean, to actually get together 24 Lowry's or whatever, it was, it's quite, that's quite an undertaking. And well, it was all, really, How yeah. did that all come about? Well, how, how did that sort of start? Well, it was something that I worked on for, you have to start early and work on it for quite a long time. That's, you, you, know? you just built, up, built it up over a number I of years. I built it up, yeah. And what was, what's interesting about that is there's a particular painting, I think it's actually a chapter in your book, it's to do with this, is it Cleetham or Chip Shop, I think it is? Um, oh, God, yeah. Yeah, this is, which, is a, which is a Lowry little um, work with crayon, actually. Um, and yeah. it's a little small picture and it's a perfect sort of northern image of a, of a chip shop and people queuing outside this chip shop and it actually represents this real place and then in the 90s I think it was 95 I think it was you were at the auction weren't uh, you? Bid, bid for it is yeah, that right? yeah I think yes it was 95 I think yeah, yeah. 95 yeah and it, that was when the Reverend Bennett died right okay. and left his collection of art to Carlisle Cathedral okay because they needed a new roof and God knows what yes so he he left his collection and his fells. I've got one of the big fells that right. uh, he owned. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and it was shown in Christie's place in um, a village that's sort of east of Penrith, okay. where they had a big house. Right. And they did a private viewing there. And then it went off to London to be auctioned. Yeah. Yeah, I came back with a lovely catalogue of that. And I showed it to one or two people in the gallery and so on. And there was a couple who wanted Carol's Fish and Chip Shop at Cleetamore. Mm-hmm. And they weren't acquainted with London auctions and yeah. stuff like that. And so they said, will you come and bid for us? And I said, oh, well, I'd love to. But it's on a Wednesday and or on a Thursday. And yeah. that's my day off. But... You know, I worked till seven on a Wednesday. I used to have a, a late night on a Wednesday. And they said, oh, we'll drive you down and all the rest. And we'll right. stay in a travel lodge on the way. <laughs> so off we went. And it was packed. Was it? And I've still got that catalogue. There were quite a lot of Lowry. Yeah. Can't remember the, the exact number now. And we went in and sat on the gilt chairs. We got there early. And Christy said they'd show these people everything beforehand. We turned up very early so that they could actually see them in the flesh because they'd not been at this opening. Yeah. That was invitation only. So they had a look and so on. And the Carl's Fish and Chip Shop had something like 8000 on it. And so I said, well, you know, what are you going to go to? And they said 10000 And I said, um, you're best to make it a little bit more because things don't end on, you know, a round figure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if it goes to 10, then you, you might get it at the next bit. So we were all very optimistic. Yeah. And so we uh, we sat through the first one, was the cover of the catalogue. Yeah. And it was one of Lowry's terrible things of a self-portrait with bright red eyes oh, of, yeah. of a goggle, Google goggle looking yeah. boy, a uh, young man. Oh. And it was called Young Man or something. Yeah. And it was absolutely awful. Oh. And <laughs> the bidding started, yes. and it just went on and on and on. And I think there was something like 20,000 on this. Yeah. And it went to about 50. Mm. And there was a man on the front row, and I didn't, I couldn't recognize him because his back was to us. But at about, I think it was at 40,000, he stood up and turned around, and I thought, oh, gosh, that's Jonathan Silver from the Salt Mill, right. you know, the friend of David Hockney. Yes. And he turned round and he said, that's enough, that's enough, but I'm going no further. So then the next bid came through and the next bid. And then I was very amused when it went quiet that Jonathan Silver joined in again and actually got it. Oh, right. So he jumped and again. Right. At which point he stood up and bowed to her and everybody clapped, which is unknown <laughs> in Christmas. So it was all very dramatic. Yeah. And then, of course, the cow's fish and chip shop came yeah. up. We didn't get a look in. Did you not? It yeah. immediately just shot up and up and up and it just kept going. Yeah. And on and on and on. And it finally sold something absolutely ridiculous. But not ridiculous in, well, in today's values because they're fetching millions. That picture, uh, that particular auction, like I think the estimate was about five to 8,000. And obviously, like you say, you were willing to bid up to 11. It sold, including commission and everything else, I think it was 45,000 pound it sold for, which was obviously yeah. massively more than what you, four times or what you were looking at. But did you, yeah. you might, I don't know if you know, but that picture again sold in 2012. Yeah. Um, yes. And did you hear what it went for in 2012? <laughs> so yeah. the, jump, the jump from 95 to 2012, to sort of, uh, again, that was sold at Christie's, and including commission and everything else, it went for 145,000. Yeah. So it well, literally went for another 100,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On top and of I that. Think that. I think the one, the co op at Cleetamore, uh, also right. fetched a hell of a lot of money. Yeah, I've, I saw that recently, actually, strangely enough. Rochdale Art Gallery had it on display because of the co op. You might have been aware of this as well. The one that you bid on was from 1948, I think it was. But there was an oil produced in 1949, which is the same scene, effectively. It looks exactly the same image. But it actually says on the front of the, the shop, the, the chip shop, it says elite fish and chip. I don't know if that means anything to you. Um, oh, not fish and chip. Elite. Uh, E-L-I- oh, elite fish and chip yes. shop. Oh, right. And that, that, that particular picture only sold a few months ago. It was this year. Uh, and that was an, that's an oil. And that went for basically sort of six hundred thousand, and that was a you know it was quite a small a small lowery oil, but it was very if you I'm, I'm, I'll email you the image or something if you want to see it, but but yeah it was there you go to start, but I thought it was interesting that was all. Um, Have yeah. you got time for a little a little story about the exhibition I put on at Lowry? Of course I have. Yeah, go on. Let's, oh, let me... all right. <laughs> <laughs> <Go on. laughs> um, yeah. Well, I began to get cold feet um, over insurance and stuff like that. 
when I realised that it was going to get a lot of publicity. Right. It was the first Lowry exhibition in a commercial gallery mm -hmm. in Cumbria, really. Yeah. And I, I just got cold feet because I thought, you know, although people don't normally nick paintings, Lowry's they do because they can make big money yeah, it's on big, them. Yeah, huge name. Yeah. And um, so I rang the police station um, just before before when when we were hanging. Yeah. I think the day we were hanging, I suddenly got COVID. And I rang and spoke to somebody and said, I just want you to know that, that this is happening. And we are alarmed. We have got police response. So I said, fine, that's good. And I thought, not much is going to happen. So we did the opening on, on the following Sunday, and it was packed and so on. And afterwards, I put the kettle on, and I and my helpers, we all sat down to you know, have a cup of tea and so on. And the doorbell went. And I went to the big front door at Castle Gate. And I said, who's there? And we got a chain on it. So I put the chain on and looked round. And it was it was just a guy there in a suit. Yeah. And uh, he said, it's police. I said, really? Can I see your document? And he said, you're on the ball, aren't you? Good. <laughs> and he pushed his, uh, he pushed his everything, yeah, you know, yeah. through the crack in the door. So I said, okay, you can come in. So I opened the door and shut it behind him and yeah. looked round. He looked round. He said, oh, you're really security minded. I'm really pleased. He said, but do you know you've got a crack in your shutter at the back? And I said, how do you know? He said, look, I've had officers over the wall in the night. He wow. said, they've gone round your place. They've, they've looked for any weak points. That's the only weak point they can find. He said, there's a crack in the shutter. Right. So I said, God, that is wonderful. Thank you <laughs> so much. And he said, don't don't worry. He said, we're there for you. Wow. We understand what, how important this exhibition is. It was every day during Lowry exhibition. When I got there at like half nine in the morning, we opened at half ten. When I got there at half nine, there was always a queue. When it got to five o'clock, throwing out time, there were people that were very reluctant to leave. And I had to kind of urge people and make them go, you know, and we had to have two people on duty at all times. Yeah. The following Sunday, Michael and myself went in to do the Sunday afternoon shift, which started at two o'clock, I think. And when we got there, there was the usual queue. And I dropped Michael off at Sainsbury's because we needed some milk and bits and pieces. He said, you go on. I think it, it was long before we got there, about one o'clock. We were very early to get in and get sorted. Yeah. And he said, I'll catch you up. So I dropped him off and I went up to the gallery. And as soon as I got anywhere near the door, they all surged forward. And I went, no, 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 I'm not open until half past two. You know, just be a bit more patient and so on. And uh, I put the key in the lock and walked in. And of course, the, the uh, alarm starts counting down. Beep, beep, beep. So I just turned to shut the door, and this man had followed me in. Right. And I said, "I'm sorry, you will have to go. I have to knock off the alarm." Yeah. And he just he he just seemed to be deaf to this. He just kind of didn't take any notice. And I said, "Please go," kind of giving him a bit yeah. of a show. Out. Nothing. He just stood there, and he was like advancing forward. And I thought, oh my god! And that moment. The alarm, it was on silent, you see, to begin with. Yeah. And then the klaxon starts and everything. And I could hear this police car coming up the hill. <laughs> I don't think the klaxon did, actually. I don't think the bell started to ring. Right. I think that the um, the police got the, the message through. And this police car coming up the hill. And this man just fled. I couldn't tell you what he looked like or wow. anything. He just went. And I don't know whether he was up to no good yeah, or not. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, that at the same time, the alarm company had rung Michael in Sainsbury's. They'd rung my son in St. Bees, who was a right. key holder. The, the police were on their way. And it was all very, very dramatic. Yeah, yeah. And, and they came rushing in and saying, where is he? Where is he? Yeah, <laughs> or why has he gone? Wow. And so on. So... The, the Lowry exhibition was very eventful. Was it, was it a joint show with Percy Kelly in the other room, I think, at the same time? Is that right? I think you had Lowry. Yes, it was. You see, I could only manage the, the big through room for Lowry. Yes. And so I thought, what can I put in the other room? Yeah. And I put Percy Kelly was the only person that I could think of. And they really didn't like each other. Did they meet again? Had they actually met? They did. Oh, yeah. Because right. Lowry had gone round to uh, Percy's house several times. Right. And each time he personally knew he was coming, he'd hide all his work. 
because he thought Larry <laughs> might copy him. <laughs> And he used to go down there with Sheila Fowler, you see. Of course, because Larry very, he was noted for going up to Cumbria. And, yeah, and, the, and he, they, liked, they liked Allenby. Yeah. And Percy said he was such a poser. He used to go and stand looking out to see, right. posing, you know. <laughs> so they really didn't like... And I think Lowry just got fed up after a while and thought, I'm just going to turn up. Yeah. And he turned up. And, and Percy was oh, aghast that Lowry had turned up unannounced. And then then started looking at his work. He didn't like people looking at his work. You know? Right. Well, there you go. <laughs> I know. I know. There's I know there's no such things as ghosts and life after death because if there were, I think that Percy would have really punished me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so obviously um, that was Lowry, and the great connection with Lowry is, of course, was Sheila Fell in in Cumbria. And you you showed she, an exhibition of Sheila Fell's work, didn't you? I mean, obviously she died very young, uh, Sheila, as, as we know, not too much longer after after Lowry, really. But no, she, um, that's right. That must have been an amazing show to have. I mean, it was like, that was, again, you didn't mess around. I mean, you had, like, the 24 Lowry's, and then the Sheila Fell exhibition was 50 paintings by Sheila Fell. I mean, to actually yeah. get that volume of Sheila Fell together, was, that must have been a huge undertaking. Quite yeah. a few were borrowed, right, rather okay. than... I think we had 20-odds for sale. Right, I see. Because that would pay for the exhibition and the insurance. Of course. It's the insurance every time that really clobbered you. Yeah. You know, when you had these big shows, the Winifred Nicholson was eye-watering yeah. insurance, yeah. you know, and the foal was pretty eye-watering anyway. Yeah. So I, I actually borrowed quite a lot in, but we sold everyone. It was the largest Sheila Fell show since since she died she in died. Cumbria, really. Yeah, there was a retrospective, you know? I think, obviously, at some point, so it was the last show would have been years and years before. That was amazing. Yeah, and, uh, and Winifred Nicholson, another one. You had, you know, you had some amazing shows. We could probably talk about them all day long. But what I'll do is just quickly then, I'll, before we sort of finish, because um, I'll mention your current thing that you've just been doing. Um, you've written a very nice little booklet for Anne Redpath. And oh yeah, I said you wanted to say. You did. You did in literally just a painting and just what is effectively a, a simple tale, if you like. And all these sorts of sets of circumstances that sort of crop up in your way of writing, it works really well in this little booklet. So, yeah, I just really enjoyed that. Um, I've got a whole list now That's of nice. paintings that have, have a story attached, that, like the Red Path one. And so I, I'll send you a copy each time. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. That's the thing with paintings. If you have a painting on, on, on your wall in your house, it's very often that you will have a little story attached to it. Obviously, it's simple as where yeah. you got it from and how you got it or if you yeah. inherited it or how your father got it or your mother got it. And there's always a tale yeah. attached to these things. So um, if you are interested in learning more about the Anne Redpath story with regards to this painting, Harmony in Red, you can pick up the booklet, which you can buy um, via PercyKelly.com um, on Chris's website. I think all the proceeds for that go into the uh, Keswick Museum as well, which they is very do. nice. Yeah. There you go. And uh, yeah, just keep checking out Chris's page because she does update it and runs this sort of blog where she keeps you updated with what she's up to and she's always writing and uh, etc. Certainly, I mean, I love Hercules and the Farmer's Wife. I think it's a great book, so I'd recommend that to anybody um, in particular, although there's sort of various other books as well, of course, Percy Kelly Five and various other things that you've written and it's been amazing to speak to you Chris thank you very much for your time and I'll let you crack on now um, with right. what you're doing for the rest of the day and we'll speak again soon yeah <laughs> what rest of the day Anthony <laughs> I know we've been on for a bit haven't we I know <laughs> I'm going to go out for a walk now <laughs> oh god I'm going to go out for a walk yeah oh well right. there we go anyway thank you very much you've, you've asked very intelligent knowledgeable questions thank you very much no it's lovely to speak to you and we'll, we'll speak again soon thank you Chris take care okay then Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the episode today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please check out the Northern Art Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash the Northern Art page. And also we've uh, recently set up a, an Instagram account, which you can check out as well. That's also the Northern Art page on Instagram. Uh, please like, comment, share, message me, whatever you want to do. It's much appreciated and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.